Hi there, and welcome to the Paula Fiscal Show. Today we have a very special guest by the name of Ed Sadler. Ed is a representative of the Golden Gate Speranza Lodge of Freemasonry here in San Francisco. And it just happens to be his birthday today also. So Ed, I want to wish you a happy birthday. And please, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a great way to spend uh, your birthday. Uh, my name is Ed Sadler. I am the master of the Golden Gate Speranza Lodge Number 30. We're a Freemason Lodge here in San Francisco. Uh, we're one of about seven or eight lodges in the city, and we're located at 14th and Terrebelle. And I'm currently the master of the lodge, and that's sort of like the president of the lodge, if you will. So yes, welcome, Ed. So I have a couple of questions. And of course, you've probably heard many of these questions. But there are lots of myths re surrounding Freemasonry. And uh, we're hoping that you're going to dispel some of these myths today. Can you, uh, first of all, give us a little bit about the structure of Freemasonry, what it is, and then uh, go into the myths? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Basically, Freemasonry, uh, most people come to Freemasonry or start studying about Freemasonry uh, from the Internet. And unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of misinformation on the Internet, especially around Freemasonry. It tells you a lot of stories about what they think Freemasonry is, what posters think. Often they're incorrect. Uh, sometimes there's accurate information on the Internet, but it's so out of context that it's essentially meaningless as well. So I'm here today mostly to dispel uh, the myths and misconceptions of Freemasonry and give you basically a straight line on what it is. And I've been a, a Mason for about 10 years, and I've gone through the different uh, officer positions, and uh, I'm very familiar with it. So I'd like to just share some of that knowledge with you all. Basically, I can start with the structure of Freemasonry. I have behind me a, a famous uh, painting, if you will, it's a print, of the structure of Freemasonry. And it's the triangle of Freemasonry. They call it the structure of Freemasonry. And basically, there's two sides to the triangle and then the base. The right side, essentially, is a group called York Rite. And York Rite is a branch of Freemasonry. It's a, what we call a capitular body. And you can go through the different degrees of the York Rite. You start with Royal or with Mark Master, go through Royal Arch, uh, another uh, body called Cryptic Council, and then you end up as a Knights Templar. The second line or angle of the triangle is the Scottish Rite, and that's on the that's depicted on the left side of this triangle. And there they have 32 degrees. And each degree is designed to teach a moral and, or a lesson or both. And as you advance through the Scottish Rite, you will ascend to the 32nd degree. And then uh, some of those uh, Scottish Rite Masons are, uh, are elevated to the 33rd degree. And, and then finally, you have the base. And the base is, the, is basic masonry. It's what we call the Craft Lodge or the Blue Lodge. It's where you take your first three degrees in masonry, and it's uh, your home lodge. And then also represented here are the other organizations like Shriners, the Grotto, and those are more of the fun side of masonry where they do a lot of fun activities. Most of the work is done in the Craft Lodge or the Blue Lodge, and I'm the master of one of those lodges at 14th and Terraville here in the city. That was a very good definition, but I would like to go back to, if you don't mind, specifically the definition of Freemason. Does that mean that you have to be a, a, a uh, carpenter? Can you give us the description and the, the difference between a speculative and an operative? operative? 
Mason? Sure, of course. Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, masonry is, uh, we are all speculative masons. An operative mason is a literal mason. It's a person who's, who lays bricks, works with mortar, uh, constructs brick walls. Also, you can extrapolate that out to uh, a person in the trades, a tile make, you know, a tile uh, layer, or uh, a framer, or a drywall person. Um, that applies to the operative mason side. The speculative side, of which I am a member, and all masons are, all Freemasons are speculative masons. That is a a type of mason that looks at morals and looks at lessons derived from allegory. And this allegory that we follow is based on uh, morals and lessons that come from, um, many of them from the King Solomon uh, time period. And we refer to those as Solomonic allegory because it refers to King Solomon. So we use tools uh, of masonry like the plumb, the level, the square, the 24-inch gauge, they all symbolize something to us as specul speculative masons. And we, we say that they're most expressive. And because they're so expressive, that we can remember them easier. They leave a imprint in our mind, in our memory. So that's why we use uh, the term mason and we adopt those tools. So just so I can get this straight, Freemasonry then, is not actually a religion, and it's not uh, a um, ritualistic type of organization that uh, does not allow, for example, we're going over some of the myths, doesn't allow Catholics or does allow Catholics. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about uh, what the uh, okay. myths are. Sure. Um. You've said a lot in that statement, so it's going to take me a couple minutes to answer that. Um, masonry is not a religion, okay? We are not a religion. However, we do say some prayers. For example, we believe that before you begin any great or important undertaking, it's necessary that you should, you know, give a blessing to God. And we do that through a, a prayer. So uh, we will say a prayer uh, at the beginning of our ceremonies. We also say the Pledge of Allegiance as well. Um, for respect for our country. Uh, we, ritual, the ritualistic part you're talking about, we do have a, uh, our lessons are all written down, and we, uh, through the years, we memorize all these lessons, and through this memorization, um, we uh, confer our ceremonies. And this is done, uh, we use the term ritual, and the term ritual is referring to the written down portions of our of our lessons and morals that we uh, commit to memory. Uh, many people freak out when they hear the term ritual. They think of witchcraft or warlocks or something like that. That's all silly. Uh, it has nothing to do with that. It's just simply it's uh, the, the material of our lessons that we memorize. So that, that refers to that. Can you talk a little bit about also um, what I see here is the Holocaust victims and Freemasons. There's a correlation. Right. And it uh, revolves around a forget-me-not. Right, right. Um, sadly, in the uh, late 20s throughout, and also throughout the 30s, and of course into the 40s, 1940s, um, Masonry in Europe especially, uh, I'm talking mostly about Nazi Germany and in Mussolini's uh, autocratic Italy, uh, masonry was forbidden, and many uh, known Masons were rounded up, and they were sent to internment camps, concentration camps. Many of them died subsequently. There was still a, uh, a, a underground membership of Freemasons during this time, and in order to identify each other, they could not use the square and compass because that was outlawed. So what they did is they adopted a a little flower, a little blue flower called a forget-me-not, and they would put that on their clothing, usually on their lapels, and f by that little flower, one mason would know another. And it, it's a very poignant symbol, and to this day, we still have forget-me-nots, and you do see brother masons wear them quite often. Uh, 
it's a documented fact that in concentration camps, there were lodges of Masons that practiced. Uh, internment camp uh, prisoners uh, would hold open lodges. Uh, they would even uh, confer degrees uh, in their barracks. And uh, this harkens back even before uh, Nazi Germany and World War II. Uh, in the Civil War, we had uh, documented lodges that were in operation in Andersonville Prison. And um, so between the North and the South, uh, Freemasonry uh, did exist, and one brother recognized another brother Mason, even at the height of war. Now, since we're in San Francisco, and we always like to hear about statistics, I'm going to ask you then, how many Freemasons are there? Well, in California, uh, according to our California Grand Lodge, uh, there's around 50,000 or so. The number has been going down over the last uh, few decades, uh, unfortunately, because our brothers get older and then they pass away. We have had, in the last five to ten years, a, I don't know if I'd use the word surge, but it's definitely been an uptick in the uh, admissions of younger men who have joined our ranks. So it is getting, uh, we are improving slowly on our membership, uh, but it hasn't peaked yet for its fall. It'll probably fall for another couple more years, and then with our new members, it'll, it'll uptick again. And what is the number worldwide? Who knows? I mean, I've heard projections that there's anywhere from four to six million Masons. It's really hard to say because the, the data that we get from other countries is spotty most of the time. And then there are other countries that may have two or more Grand Lodges, and they all have their own numbers, and they dispute each other. So it, it's hard to put an accurate number to that worldwide total. Is there a, um, an application, or is there a, a initiation, or a, a hazing that goes through for people to become a Mason? Good question. To become a Mason, you have to be at least 18 years of age. And in California, you have to be male. You have to live in the state, of course. And you have to believe in a supreme being. Those are the requirements to become a Mason. The supreme being is defined by yourself. But you have to believe in something bigger than yourself. Otherwise, no obligation you make will be considered binding. If you, how can you hold yourself accountable to your supreme being, to your supreme maker, if you don't believe in that? So that's why we require a belief in a supreme being. There is no hazing that goes on. We're very, very careful about that. Every initiation that a, 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 a man will go through, we've all been through the exact same initiation. Uh, we really want to see the potential person. We call it knocking at the door. So when a, a person comes and is knocking at the door and just wants to check us out, we invite them, him to our dinners. Uh, we always have like an open house once a month. They come, they meet the other uh, members of the lodge, they get to know them a little bit, and, and the, the members get to know the, the, the person uh, who's um, knocking at the door a little bit as well. And we encourage that person to come minimum five, six times before we even give him an application because we want to make sure it's a right fit because every lodge in the city is a little different, and they have their own little culture and our culture at Golden Gate Bronze is a little different than our Thursday Night Lodge, which is in our same building called the Phoenix Lodge. Uh, their culture is a little different than ours. And likewise, the other lodges in the city have their own look and feel. So it's very important that there be a fit because we just don't want to take men into the organization, uh, administer and confer degrees onto them, and then they disappear. We want them to really be part of, of Freemasonry. So we take our time with membership. That's very good information to know, particularly for our viewers that uh, really don't know much about Freemasonry. And however, 
when we talk about Freemasonry, the first thing that comes to my mind anyway is the Shriners. Mm -hmm. And they're in the parades. In fact, when Gavin Newsom um, was first our mayor in San Francisco, um, he opened up his brand new mayoral uh, parade, so to speak, with uh, an award to one of the children from the Shriners Hospital. Yeah. So how is that integrated with your lodge? Okay. The, uh, the Shriners, I, I mentioned them at the very beginning of, of the interview uh, when I was explaining the structure of Freemasonry. They're, um, they do a lot of seriously good work. Um, they are serious in, their, in the work they do for kids. However, they are the, one of the fun organizations of Masonry. Uh, a lot of Shriners are clowns. They're literally clowns. They dress up as clowns. Professional clowns is right. what we're talking about. Professional they have, clowns. They have yeah. their own clown outfit. Yes. Uh, a lot of Shriners are in the Arabian band, they call it, where they play instruments during parades. Right, right. Uh, you have Shriners on, on little scooters. Uh, you have Shriners, you know, that ride mounted patrols. They, they ride horses. Uh, so there, you, you have a lot of different clubs that, that you as a Shriner can be part of. Um, the, the famous work that the Shriners do is, of course, the, the work that they do with the hospitals. And throughout the country, there are around 21, 22 different uh, hospitals, Shriners hospitals for children. That many? And that many, yes. And they uh, do not charge their patients any money for the services. They are top-notch, world-class in orthopedics and in burns. And it's amazing the work they do. And again, they, they do not require parents of these children to pay. Um, that, that's not what it's about. It's about the children. So uh, every, uh, every lodge has a couple Shriners in it at the minimum. I happen to be a Shriner as well. Uh, our lodge has about five or six Shriners that I know of. So uh, yes, Shriners are really integrated into the whole Masonic realm. And yes, a Shriner is a Mason. Um, all Shriners are Masons, but not all Masons are Shriners. Oh, it's an good. easy way to remember <laughs> That's that. That's a good way to put that. And can you also talk about the scholarship program that uh, is available for higher education? Sure, sure. Um, the Masons do great work in community giving. And I wanted to take a few minutes to just describe and to name some of the things that, that we are doing. Um, because a, a, a lot of folks just don't realize that. They think we're a secretive organization, and it's crazy what some people think about the Masons. Uh, everything from, from being totally secret to trying to take over the world, you name it, you know? And the Illuminati, don't and forget that. And, of course, that. the Illuminati. Um, Made famous by the movies. Yes. And all of that's false. Um, yes, the Illuminati did exist, but it was a very small group that lived, uh, or that, that, operated in Bavaria in the 1700s for a short period of time and they were eventually squashed by the monarchy there. So that, that was just a little blip, but of course we've blown that all up. And they were not affiliated with the Masons. Okay. They were their own little thing. But with that said, that's all fiction basically, but here's some nonfiction. This is reality. And here in San Francisco, one of the things I want to bring up before I forget is in November, San Francisco is hosting the 14th World Conference of, Ma of Masons, of Freemasons. And this is a wonderful once-in-a-lifetime event where Masons throughout the world will descend upon San Francisco in November. And for a week, we will have seminars and we will get to know each other and share all our good works and, more importantly, take in ideas to do things better because, you know, we're not perfect. So there's always room for improvement. And San Francisco is going to be hosting that at our Grand Lodge at 1111 uh, California Street uh, up on right, right at Kitty Quarter from the... Um, cathedral Church. Well, the Cathedral Church. The Sonic then, Temple, yes. And across then, what's the that street? hotel? The Fairmont. The Fairmont. The Fairmont Hotel. Yes, yes. And uh, so another big temple is the one on 19th Avenue. Right. The Scottish Rite the Temple Scottish Rite is Temple. on 19th and Slote. And, and Scottish Rite, if you remember, that was the, uh, the other, the other uh, branch of the triangle, the other line of the Scottish Rite. So our, our Scottish Rite in San Francisco is at 19th and Slote. 
So let me tell you about these, these, these things that we're doing. Um, we, have, uh, we have a Grand Lodge, and we just spoke about where they're located, and they sponsor a lot of wonderful things. One of the things they sponsor is the uh, giving grants for nurses, for uh, oncological nurses in particular. And we have a program for that. So if, if uh, a nurse is studying for oncology, they can uh, uh, go to freemasons.org. That's the Grand, uh, uh, web, web, the Grand Lodge website for Freemasons in California, freemason.org. And check out the information on obtaining a grant for oncological study as a nurse, as an RN. We have another great program called Raising a, Raising a Reader. And this is a program that we've supported now for the last uh, five years or so. And this involves going into kindergarten classes throughout the state, Northern California and Southern California. And we've gone in, uh, into hundreds of kindergarten classes. And what we do is we furnish books. Um, and each kid will take five good quality, hardbound, tough books that will last for the school year. And they will be issued five books in a bag, and they'll take these books home and have their mom, dad, brother, sister, family member read to them. And through this reading, uh, they, it'll help them um, you know, become proficient quicker in their reading, and they won't, you know, the chances of them falling behind is a lot less. Uh, this program uh, has proved to be very beneficial, and when a child finishes those five books, he brings it back to school, and he gets issued another five books, five different books, and he continues the process. So we've outfitted hundreds of classrooms for this, and it's something that the Grand Lodge supports as well as many local lodges. Uh, Golden Gate Speranza, my lodge, also is a big uh, supporter of raising a reader. And how is that process? Uh, does the teacher volunteer? Is it the principal? Is it the school? How, how do you select the schools? Well, our Grand Lodge, we have a, um, a department, uh, a whole uh, area of education that's dedicated to public education. And staff members will go to, uh, to the uh, principals of these schools and talk with them and share with them what our program's about. And then we also have uh, members of the philanthropy department in Grand Lodge that will also assist in this area. And then the, the lodges, the constituent lodges, like Golden Gate Speranza, um, we will be asked to, um, to assist. And usually um, we can donate money to the cause, and uh, about $3,000 will outfit a class for the whole year. So uh, we've, been, we've been adopting classes, and a lot of constituent lodges, lodges do it that way they'll adopt a kindergarten class. Mm -hmm. So that's how we do that. So and that's a, a wonderful, wonderful program. Right, Raising and, a Reader. And uh, that's uh, two then you've spoken about. And right. you've got one more. Okay. We, have, we have another one that's really, really <coughs> big. It's called the Investment in Success. And these are scholarships. And so the way that works is um, we, a as a uh, organization, at once a year, we will interview we will interview um, 40 or so deserving high school seniors who uh, don't have the economic means to go to college. And we will take their, um, the recommendations from their counselors and principals, and we will interview them. And from that, we will award about 20 uh, or so uh, scholarships, each worth about $7,000. And we will award those so these students can go to usually they'll go to community college first and then they'll transfer to a four-year. So it gets them through that first couple of years. And, and that's a wonderful program. Uh, we do many other things, but we have time constraints, so I can't get into those right now. Thank you, Ed. Uh, there are a, a lot of good deeds that your group does, and I want to thank you for coming to the show and helping dispel some of the myths. Are there any other uh, benefits to being a Mason that you might want to discuss? The biggest, yes, the, the biggest benefit by far is uh, Masonry makes men better. When you come to Masonry uh, a, as a man, uh, you go through our, our, our lessons, you go through our teachings, 
and you come out of it a, a much better man. You're a much better husband, a much better brother, father, uh, and friend. It, it is, it's been life-changing for me, and it's something that I'm going to stay with my whole life in, in one capacity or another. So um, I encourage everyone, go visit a Masonic Lodge and, and check it out for yourself. That was the next question I was going to ask you, is how it has affected your life and how you would recommend to other people to perhaps do a little more research into Freemasonry. Okay. Um, for me personally, I've become much more disciplined. Um, I was very uh, hot-headed when I uh, was younger, and uh, I've learned to control my, my, uh, my moods. I've learned to uh, be more rational. Uh, I've learned to deal with adversity in, in a much better, healthier way. Uh, I've learned to become more patient. And, and this is what I've learned through uh, my study of, in, in Freemasonry. And, and I've, I've learned to become a better speaker and also uh, a better collaborator uh, in groups as well. And so to close, can you tell us your email in case anyone would like to contact you? Sure, sure. Let me give you, um, let me reiterate the Grand Lodge website. It's www.freemason.com. Dot org. There's also an, another great one called Scottish Rite, and that's spelled R-I-T-E at the end, scottishrite.org. They have great information on programs that we offer. My personal email, and you're free to send me an email with any questions around Freemasonry at any time, it's Ed W. Sadler, and that's S-A-D-L-E-R, at gmail.com. Thank you so much for joining us. and. Again, if you'd like to see all of our shows, you can take a look at the YouTube or look on Sundays from 3, 3 p.m. on Channel 29. Thank you.